The European Commission adopted a chemical strategy for sustainability one year ago now. It was hailed as radical and wide-ranging. The chemical strategy is also a major deliverable of the European Green Deal and a first step towards the EU's zero pollution ambition. I'm honored to discuss the achievements of the first year and the expectations for the coming period with Cristina de Avila, head of the Sustainable Chemicals Unit at DG Environment. Cristina, can you tell us a bit about the thinking behind the strategy and how it fits the Green Deal? And what makes this strategy radical and wide-ranging, considering EU chemicals legislation is already top of class in the world? You're right, Ted. The EU already has a sophisticated chemicals legislation. And thanks to our legislation, we have the most advanced knowledge base on chemicals in the world. More importantly, according to our evaluations, EU chemicals legislation has effectively reduced the risks to people and to the environment from some very hazardous chemicals, like carcinogens. However, science is alerting us that there are still areas where we urgently need to act. For example, even today, people, including the most vulnerable, are still exposed to very harmful chemicals, in particular through consumer products. There are many chemicals that can cause chronic diseases. Cancer is the most notorious of them, but chemicals can also cause asthma, diseases of the immune system, of the cardiovascular system, diseases that have been at the forefront, making our population vulnerable in view of the COVID-19 pandemic. On the environmental side, chemical pollution is recognized by scientists as one of the key drivers putting the earth at risk. With the strategy, we are presenting a clear vision, objectives, and a concrete action plan to address these challenges. The overall vision is to ensure that by 2030, we achieve a toxic-free environment, where chemicals are produced and used in a way that maximizes their contribution to society while avoiding harm to the planet and to current and future generations. The Green Deal is about the future. It is a plan for sustainable growth for the European Union, a circular economy with zero pollution and a toxic-free environment. I applaud your ambitions. How are you planning to get there? In this strategy, we have two overarching and mutually supportive objectives. One, boosting innovation for safe and sustainable chemicals, and the other, increasing the protection of health and the environment. We also have what we call three key enablers, simplification and coherence, knowledge and science, and international dimension. The strategy intends to create a shift towards new chemicals and materials that are inherently safe and sustainable from production to end of life. Safe and sustainable chemicals must become the EU market norm, and this will be a win-win for the protection of people and the environment and for the competitiveness of the European industry, which needs to regain global market. How does this support the green transition of the chemical sector and its value chain? And can you define concrete actions? The, the strategy is the key to support the green transition of the chemical sector and its value chain, including by promoting EU's open strategic autonomy for those critical chemicals that are needed to build the technologies that we need to achieve climate neutrality. Now, to arrive at that situation, where chemicals are safe and sustainable by design, we have quite a long list of actions. We need to develop criteria for safe and sustainable by design chemicals. We need to establish an EU-wide support network to promote the cooperation and the sharing of information across the sectors and the value chain and provide technical expertise on alternatives. We are committed to ensuring financial support for the commercialization and uptake of safe and sustainable by design chemicals, materials and products, and the relevant EU funding and investment instruments and public and private partnerships. We are mapping and addressing safe and sustainable by design skill mismatches and competence gaps and ensuring adequate skill at, skills at all levels, including in vocational and tertiary education, research, industry and amongst the regulators. We will establish in close cooperation with the stakeholders key performance indicators to measure the industrial transition towards the production of safe and sustainable chemicals. And finally, we will ensure that legislation on industrial emissions promotes the use of safer chemicals by industry in the EU by requiring on-site risk assessments and by restricting the use of substances of very high concern. You mentioned the strategy is boosting innovation. In what way and with which tools? To promote innovation, the strategy also identifies other areas, namely achieving safe products and non-toxic material cycles, amongst others by minimizing the presence of substances of concern in products giving priority to those product categories that affect vulnerable populations, as well as those with the highest potential for circularity, through requirements in the Sustainable Products Initiative. Greening and digitalizing the production of chemicals and strengthening the EU's open strategic autonomy by identifying strategic value chains that where critical chem chemicals or technologies are needed and promoting resilience of supply. The actions in the strategy on innovation in general and safe and sustainable by design in particular 
are closely related and therefore they need to be coherent with other regulatory and non-regulatory actions announced in the chemical strategy, such as the establishment and updating of research and innovation agenda for chemicals, ensuring that consumer products do not contain the most harmful chemicals through the, through the revision of REACH and also the product-related specific legislation, assessing how to best introduce information requirements on the overall environmental footprint of chemicals, including on emissions of greenhouse gases through the revision of REACH, and defining criteria for essential uses, to ensure that the most harmful chemicals are only allowed if their use is necessary for health, safety, or it is critical for the functioning of society, and if there are no alternatives that are acceptable from the standpoint of environmental health in all relevant EU chemicals legislation. You've given us a very comprehensive overview of an innovation agenda for chemicals, and you've fully convinced me that innovation is a main pillar of the strategy. What is the other pillar? The other pillar is protection and prevention. And I can summarize our protection measure in, in, in three objectives. First, we will ensure that all chemicals on the market are used safely and sustainably. Second, we will promote and reward substitution for those chemicals causing long-term effects on humans and environment, the substance of concern. And third, we will avoid that the most harmful chemicals are present in consumer products or affect vulnerable groups. We already have substances of very high concern, SVHCs. What do you mean by most harmful chemicals? And why are they still present in consumer products? Most harmful chemicals include, for example, endocrine disruptors, a substance that are highly persistent in the environment, but also others such as immunotoxicants, neurotoxicants, and respiratory sensitizers. Our regulations do not yet have all-encompassing restrictions for those, for those substances in consumer products. In fact, for some of these hazards, we do not even have an identification system that can apply horizontally. So we're in the process of revising the CLP regulation and their hazard criteria to include new hazard classes for endocrine disruptors and for PVTs, as well as revising the restriction rules in REACH, but also in other pieces of legislation regulating consumer uses, such as cosmetics, toys, food content materials, and of course REACH. In particular, endocrine disruptors and persistent substances will be banned from consumer products, together with other harmful substances in a second stage, for example, those that affect the respiratory and the immune systems. PFAS will only be allowed in essential uses and will support the contamination of PFAS, for example, in water, soil, and waste. We will start addressing horizontally the issue of combination effects of chemicals by including a mixture assessment factor or factors in the chemical safety assessment under each. What if some of these very harmful substances are needed to achieve the climate goals, for example, substances that belong to the PFAS group? Well, in that case, we would need to consider applying the concept of essential use. Some of the most harmful substances may be essential, if the use is necessary for health, for safety, or it's critical for the functioning of society, and if they are not acceptable alternatives. We are working on draft criteria for essential use at the moment. The strategy also refers to the simplification and consolidation of the legislation. Can you tell us what that entails? Yes. The purpose is to simplify and consolidate the EU legal framework, and to strengthen reach and the classification, labeling and packaging of hazardous substances regulation, CLP, as a cornerstone of EU chemicals legislation. One Substance One Assessment aims to improve efficiency, effectiveness and coherence of delivery of safety assessments of chemicals across legislation. This process will ensure simplification and greater transparency of chemicals risk assessments. Overall, it will result in reduced burdens for, actors, for all actors. It will promote consistent and faster decision making and greater predictability. It will also support the gradual move away from assessing and regulating chemicals substance by substance to regulating them by groups. Enforcement and compliance of chemical legislation must be stepped up, in particular by strengthening the principles of no data, no market. We are also looking into carrying audits in member states and setting up uniform conditions and frequency of checks for certain products. The most targeted areas will be those with the highest risk of no compliance. In particular, we are looking into online sales, imported articles, classification and labeling, and restrictions. One substance, one assessment sounds a bit like a slogan, but is it possible? The reality is that we have different legislation for different products, like food contact material, toys, cosmetics, etc. We also have different agencies, ECA, EFSA, OSHA, probably for good reasons. True, but as I said, we want, to be more, we want more transparency, we want more consistency, coherence and predictability. So the one substance, one assessment will mean some reorganization and we'll have a clear plan. And not only that, a working group between commission services and agencies is already in full swing. The plan is as follows. The initiation of safety assessments, 
example, by different agencies, is synchronized and coordinated as far as possible. And substances are assessed in groups rather than substance by substance. The allocation of responsibilities for performing the assessments is clear. It makes the best use of available expertise and resources in the agencies, and there is a good cooperation amongst all players. Data are easy to find and access. They can be used for different applications, they must be secure, of high quality, and they must be shared and reused by default without technical and administrative burdens. Methodologies used are coherent and to the extent possible harmonized, and there is a high level of transparency in performing the assessments as well as in the underlying scientific data and information. I think we covered almost all the main actions of the strategy, but let's talk a bit about the need for more knowledge and science. On knowledge, we take pride in having today world-class information on substances, but we need to recognize that it is still quite limited. We need to start acquiring some knowledge on polymers. We need to be able to identify the most harmful substances at any production volume. It is useless to say that we do not want them in consumer products if we do not know which are the substances. And amongst this, we need to absolutely identify all the substances that cause cancer. This is a necessary step in our fight against the disease. We also need to start having information on environmental footprint, as well as improve our knowledge on the use of chemicals amongst others by tracking substance of concerns in products and in materials. In addition, we need to establish a new research and innovation agenda for chemicals, promote innovative testing and risk assessment methods and the regulatory uptake. We need to finance via, via the research and innovation programs human environmental biomonitoring. We want to create an EU, war, EU early warning and action system for chemicals and establish a framework of indicators to better assess our policies. The EU likes to portray itself as the global leader and also the strategy mentions that. Indeed, chemicals are a global business and we propose a number of objectives and actions to step up international standards on the sound management of chemicals and for the EU to lead on safe and sustainable chemicals. To note here that the strategy, for example, proposes that chemicals that are banned to be placed in the EU, in the EU internal market should, be now not, should not be allowed for exports. Thank you so much for this overview. I've also seen the action plan with 85 actions and quite a tight timeline. Now that you're one year down the track, does your timeline still look realistic? Well, surprisingly, yes. We are advancing and we are on track with all the actions that I have mentioned. We are very busy preparing the impact assessments for CLP and REACH. We are preparing criteria for essential use, we are preparing criteria for safe and sustainable by design, we are working on the revisions of, of legislation, and the European Commission proposal for CLP is expected uh, somewhere in mid-2022 uh, and for reach by the end of 2022. The revisions of product legislation, such as the food contact materials, cosmetics, toys, and the new sustainable products initiative are planned for 2022 or 2023. The reallocation of scientific tasks, this is uh, for the one substance one assessment, is in the planning for 2022. A new self-standing founding regulation for ECA is planned for 2023 at the latest. And an initiative on transparency and reuse of data is also planned for 2023. It is a lot of work, but the Commission is strongly committed to, to this agenda. We are also very appreciative of stakeholder support from different sectors and at different levels. And also, the Member States are right behind the strategy in the Environment Council. It would only be possible to keep the time schedule if stakeholders work with us constructively. They can be critical, of course, there is no problem about that. But they need to realise that changes are necessary and we need to overcome the obstacles together. I do believe it's possible. We need to join forces between all the main players in society to face the challenges and grasp the opportunities for climate, the circular economy, the digital transition and the move to a toxic-free environment. Christina, thank you very much. We are all eager to learn more about this at ChemCon Europe 2022 in London. Looking forward to seeing Christina and her colleagues in London.